having persuaded Congress to pay for, well, a tiny fraction of the ships they'd actually proposed under their grand plans for the 1890s, the US Navy was counting itself somewhat fortunate. From a decade before, when their modern capital ship force had amounted to pretty much hopes and dreams, they now had two large armoured cruiser-ish ships, three somewhat coastal battleships, and a more ocean-going one in the form of the USS Iowa, the first one. Plus, three more coastal-ish types and two more rather more wide-ranging types under construction. It wasn't a massive fleet by the standards of the largest powers of the time, but it was more than enough to deter almost anybody from casually grabbing bits of the USA, at least if they came by sea. American mines thus began to turn towards balancing this force with cruisers and destroyers as 1898 dawned. Then the USS Maine visited Havana and exploded. This, in turn, led to war with Spain and the inevitable call for more battleships, which, unsurprisingly, ended up being named the Maine class. The first thought was to use the more ocean-going US Navy designs as a basis, but it also became apparent that a number of new technologies had recently emerged that would force a relatively new clean slate design to be made. Smokeless powder, or perhaps more accurately, reduced smoke powder, was also considerably more powerful which allowed a gun with a smaller calibre to hit harder than older, larger weapons, especially if it was paired with a longer barrel. Additionally, the brief reign of Harvey steel armour had been ended by the advent of Krupp steel, and new boilers worked better and weighed less than their older counterparts. All of this in turn meant a smaller engineering space and thus less displacement used by the power plant, thinner but stronger armour, and thus again less displacement for a similar layout, and the abandonment of the up until then standard in the US Navy 13-inch 35 calibre gun in favour of a 12-inch 40 calibre weapon. To match the latest battleships, including some being built privately in the US yards for other powers, these advances allowed the main class to hit 18 knots using 16,000 indicated horsepower via two screws, which, when combined with the new armour, oceanic capabilities, and 12-inch guns, gave the US Navy its first proper all-around pre-dreadnought. Displacement was a fraction under 13,000 tonnes at normal loading, and the main class would be armed with an unsurprising four 12-inch guns mounted in a pair of twin turrets, one fore and one aft standard pre-dreadnought stuff. The secondary battery was of 16 casement-mounted 6-inch guns spaced over two decks with 8 per side, plus smaller tertiary and quaternary batteries of 47mm and 37mm guns, plus a pair of submerged torpedo tubes, which was another departure from previous designs in the US Navy which had featured above-water launchers. Belt armour was 11 inches thick at its thickest point, with slightly thicker turret armour and a surprisingly well-protected 2.5 to 4 inches of deck armour, when well, at least for a pre-dreadnought. This combination rendered them considerably better protected than the majority of late 1890s battleships, many of whom had taken the opportunities afforded by Krupp Steel to drastically reduce their armour thickness and thus save weight, giving them broadly similar protection to the older armour materials, whereas US ships took some weight savings, but also improved their protection in absolute terms compared to their older ships. This trend towards favouring protection would hold for most of the US Navy's battleship building period, with only a few exceptions. Three ships would make up the class, Maine, Missouri and Ohio, laid down in 1899 and 1900, and entering the fleet between the end of 1902 and the end of 1904. The first two ships were built on the east coast, and the last on the west coast, with the Panama Canal still some time off, it was thought best to assign the ships to the fleets based in the oceans of their construction, at least for the first few years of service. Ohio would end up joining the Atlantic Fleet in 1907. All three members of the class would start the voyage of the Great White Fleet later that year, although issues with the efficiency of her machinery would mean that Maine herself was sidelined after the first leg of the trip to, into the Pacific, completing an around-the-world voyage along with USS Alabama via a slightly more direct route. 
time, however, was marching on a pace, and less than a decade after their commission, the ships had not only been bypassed by several further generations of pre-dreadnought, but the US Navy was also in the process of bringing several of the new dreadnought-type battleships into the fleet. So before the late 1900s and early 1910s were out, they were already reduced to secondary roles, mostly training cruises and keeping an eye on Mexico. Even World War I wouldn't see them brought back to full active duty. They were instead used to train large numbers of new sailors for the now rapidly expanding and modernising United States Navy. Thanks to said war granting the US Navy a considerably larger budget alongside the aforementioned expansion and technological advances, all three ships were taken out of service in the last years of the 1910s once the war was over and sold for scrap in the early 1920s. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.